It's scaring me. Well, hi, everybody. Um, wow, it's a big turnout. This is great. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm Alan Drew. I'm the director of the Literary Festival, and no, my voice does not usually sound like this. Um, I'm not trying, as one of my students suggested I was trying to do earlier today, I'm not trying to sound like um, Barry White, so um, hopefully you can hear me just fine. Is that, can you hear me back there? Is everything okay? All right, great. Um, again, thank you for all for coming out. I think you're in for a, a wonderful treat this evening. Um, I wanted to go ahead and uh, before I introduce the two students who will be introducing Ms. Stroud this evening, I just want to make a few announcements and some acknowledgments. Um, this is, as many of you know, uh, the 12th Annual Villanova Literary Festival. This is the first reading of the semester, and I just want to let you know about some of the other ones that are coming up. Um, on February 11th, we'll have Arthur Phillips, the, the fiction writer, will be reading from his most recent book, The Song Is You. Uh, it'll take place in the De Leon Room, uh, 300 at St. Augustine Center. Did I say February 11th? Okay. If I missed something, please tell me. Um, the next reader will be Anthony Swafford. Um, he'll be reading from his memoir, Jarhead, about uh, being a sniper in the first Gulf War. That'll be February 18th in the President's Lounge here in Connolly Center. Our first poet of the series is Anja Linko. Um, she's going to read from her uh, new collection, of Shoulder Seas, on April 13th, and that'll be in the Fallview Library. It was co-sponsoring the event. And we'll end the, uh, the festival with uh, Peter Fallon and the Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney. Um, this is in conjunction with Irish Studies, and that'll be April 20th, and it'll be in the Villanova Room, I guess, which is right next door, um, here in Connolly Center as well. Um, all the readings, except for the Heaney and Fallon reading, are free. Uh, the Heaney and Fallon reading is $10. Tickets are not on sale yet. Um, if you need to know any more information about that, you can go to the English Department website, and there'll be, um, when tickets go on sale, that will be available there. Oh, and they all start at 7 p.m. Okay. I think that's it. Um, I need to thank uh, our co-sponsors for the festival, um, the College of Liberal Arts and Studies, um, Arts and Sciences, and the English Department. I want to thank all the faculty in the English Department for um, you know, having your students read the, 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 the literature um, of the, the authors. Uh, without that, uh, it would be very difficult to, to fill up the house that we are right now. It's wonderful to see so many students here. Um, I also would like to thank uh, our studies, uh, Gender and Women's Studies, Africana Studies, uh, the Fabi Library, the Honors Program, and the Writing Center, and Modern Language and Literature. And I need to throw a special thanks out to Ken Mont, the graduate assistant who has been tying up all my loose ends um, and putting this thing together. Um, has been doing a lot of really wonderful work that makes this make this all happen. Um, for those of you who came for the brownies, they are in the back. Um, better get them quickly before they're gone. Um, there are some more healthy choices back there, such as uh, fruit, if you're so inclined. Um, there's water and soda back there as well, and uh, Ms. Stroud has agreed to do the question and answer after the reading, and she will be signing some books afterwards as well, and there are a bunch of books in the back, in the right, in the corner, for sale for such purposes. So thank you again for all coming out, and I'm going to turn it over to Megan and Christina, who will be doing the formal introductions. Thanks. Elizabeth Strout's writing has been called funny, wicked, and remorseful, as well as perceptive and deeply empathetic. Recently awarded the Pulitzer Prize for her collection, Olive Kittredge, Strout has also published two other novels, Abide With Me and Amy and Isabel, a New York Times bestseller. Growing up in Portland, Maine, Strout was an avid reader and writer from a young age. Her books are influenced by the, by the physical beauty of New England, a vibrant and detailed setting that reappears in all three of Strout's work of fiction. Stroud attended Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, and graduated with a BA in English. She later attended the College of Law at Syracuse University and graduated with her law degree as well as her certificate in gerontology, the study of aging. Soon she moved to New York City and began working as an adjunct professor of English at Manhattan Community College. Her stories were published in literary magazines as well as Seventeen and Red Book. While raising a family and teaching at the college, Stroud found time to devote several hours a day to writing. In 1998, Strauss' first novel, Amy and Isabel, was published to high praise and landed a position on the New York Times bestsellers list. The novel, which took Strauss seven years to write, describes the complex relationship between a mother and her teenage daughter. Strauss' second novel, Abide With Me, was published six years later to high praise. It tells the story of a minister fighting to hold on to his calling and his family after a life-changing loss. 
As recently noted in The New Yorker, Strout animates the ordinary with astonishing force. She makes us experience not only the terrors of change, but also the terrifying hope that change can bring. She plunges us into these churning waters and we come up gasping for air. Described by Publishers Weekly as easy to read and impossible to forget, Strout's Pulitzer Prize winning collection, Olive Kitteridge, is a compilation of 13 short stories influenced by a grumpy retired school teacher named Olive Kitteridge. Through the eyes of Olive, her family, and the townspeople of Crosby, Maine, Strout paints a portrait of Olive's character that is deeply emotional and painfully real. As funny as she is caustic and as hopeful as she is regretful, Olive represents the emotional complexities present in everyday life. Entertainment Weekly praises, rarely does a story collection pack such a gutsy emotional punch. We're so lucky and grateful to have Elizabeth with us here today. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm so impressed with the poise with which both young women conducted themselves. I it's a little hard act to follow. <laughs> I stutter and fall over, but um, I, I probably won't and fall over. And thank you um, so much for, for all showing up and, and for standing. My goodness, I can't stand for more than five minutes. Or, well, no, I will when I'm reading. But, <laughs> But if you'd like to just sit on the floor, and, um, I appreciate it. Or if you need to, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to read um, a little bit from the story Security. I can't read a whole story; um, it's too long. And I think that, um, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. It was May, and Olive Kittredge was going to New York. She had never in her 72 years set foot in the city, although she had on two occasions many years ago sat in a car and ridden past it, Henry at the wheel worried about this exit and that, and seen from a distance the skyline, buildings against buildings, gray against a gray sky. Like a science fiction city it had seemed built on a moon, it held no appeal, not then, not now. Although back when those planes ripped through the towers, Olive had sat in her bedroom and wept like a baby. Not so much for this country, but for the city itself, which had seemed to her to become suddenly no longer a foreign hardened place, but as fragile as a class of kindergarten children, brave in their terror. Jumping from the windows, it clutched her heart, and she had felt a private sickening shame to know that two of the dark-haired hijackers, silently thrilled with their self-righteousness, had come down through Canada and walked through the airport in Portland on their way to such hellacious destruction. She might have driven right by them that morning. Who knows? Time passed, though, as it does. And the city, at least from Olive's faraway vantage, seemed eventually itself again, no place she cared to go, in spite of the fact that her only son had moved there recently, acquired a second wife, and two children not his. The new wife, Anne, if you were to believe the one photograph that took ages to download, <laughs> was as tall and big as a man, pregnant now with Christopher's child, and according to a characteristically cryptic email from Chris, with no attention paid to punctuation or any use of capital letters, <laughs> Anne was tired and had pukes. <laughs> In addition, it seemed Theodora turned into a hellion each morning before going off to preschool. Olive had been summoned to help. The request had not been put this way. After sending the note, Christopher had called from his office and said, Anne and I have been hoping you'll come visit for a couple of weeks. To Olive, this meant they needed help. It had been years since she'd been in the company of her son for a couple of weeks. Three days, she said. After that, I stink like fish. A week then, Chris had countered, adding, you could walk Theodore to school. It's around the corner, one block. Like hell, she thought. Her tulips, seen right there through her dining room window, jubilant cups of yellow and red would be dead by the time she got back. Give me a few days to make the arrangements, she said. The arrangements took 20 minutes. She called Emily Buck at the post office and told her to hold her mail. Oh, this will be good for you, Olive, said Emily. Aunt, said Olive, I'm sure. 
Then she called Daisy up the road and asked her to water the garden. Daisy, who'd had fantasies, Olive was certain of this, of living out her widowhood with Henry Kittredge, if only Olive could have died early on, said she would be glad to water the garden. Henry was always so good about watering mine when I went to see Mother, Daisy said. Daisy added, this will be good for you, Olive. You'll have a good time. A good time was not something Olive expected to have again. That afternoon, she drove to the nursing home and explained to Henry what she was up to. While he sat most motionless in his wheelchair, the expression on his face, one he frequently wore, that of confused politeness, as though something had been placed on his lap that he could not comprehend, but which he felt required a polite expression of thanks. Whether or not he was deaf, there was still some question. Olive did not believe he was, nor did Cindy, the one nice nurse. Olive gave Cindy the number in New York. She a good person, this new one? Cindy counted pills into Dixie cups. Having a clue, Olive said. Fertile, though, I guess, Cindy said, <laughs> picking up a tray of meds. Olive had never been in a plane by herself. Not that she was by herself now, of course. There were four other passengers with her in this plane, which was half the size of a Greyhound bus. All of them had gone through security with the complacency of cows, all of seeming the only one with trepidation. She'd had to remove her suede sandals and the big Timex watch of Henry's that she wore on her large wrist. Perhaps it was the queer intimacy of standing there in her pantyhose feet, worried that the watch might not work after it went through the machine, that made her for one half a second fall in love with the big security fellow, who said kindly, there you go, ma'am handing her the plastic bowl that had rolled toward her with the watch in it. The pilots as well, both looking 12 years old with their unworried brows, had been kind in the easy way they'd asked Olive if she'd mind sitting toward the back for weight distribution <laughs> before they climbed into the cockpit closing the steel door. A thought unfolded before her, their mothers should be proud. <laughs> And then, as the little plane climbed higher, and Olive saw spread out below them fields of bright and tender green in this morning sun, farther out the coastline, the ocean shiny and almost flat, tiny white wakes behind a few lobster boats, then Olive felt something she had not expected to feel again, a sudden surging greediness for life. She leaned forward, peering out the window. Sweet pale clouds. The sky is blue as your hat, the new green of the fields, the broad expanse of water. Seen from up here, it all appeared wondrous, amazing. She remembered what hope was, and this was it. That inner churning that moves you forward, plows you through life the way the boats below plowed the shiny water, the way the plane was plowing forward to a place new and where she was needed. She had asked to be a part of her son's life. But at the airport, Christopher seemed furious. She had forgotten that because of security, he would not be able to meet her at the gate, and apparently it hadn't occurred to him to remind her. Why this should make him so angry, Olive couldn't figure out. She was the one who had wandered around the luggage area with panic bubbling through her, her face hot as fire by the time Christopher found her lumbering back up the stairs. Godfrey, he said, not even reaching to take her bag. Why can't you just get a cell phone like everyone else? It was not until later, hurtling down an expressway with four lanes and more cars than Olive had ever seen moving together, that Christopher said, so how is he? The same, she answered, and said nothing more until they had taken an exit and were moving through streets lined with uneven buildings, Christopher lurching the car around double parked trucks. How's Anne? Olive asked then, shifting her feet for the first time since she'd gotten into the car, and Christopher said, uncomfortable, adding in a didactic doctorish tone, it gets very uncomfortable, as though entirely ignorant of the fact that Olive herself had once been pregnant, uncomfortable. And he added, Annabelle's waking up in the night again. Ducky, said Olive, duck soup. The buildings were lower now, all with steep stoops in the front. She said, you indicated little Teddy's become quite a handful. Theodore, said Christopher. God, whatever you do, don't call him Teddy. He pulled the car up sharply and backed into a space near the sidewalk. Honestly, Mom, 
Christopher ducked his head, his blue eyes looking straight into hers the way he would do years ago. He said softly, Theodore has always been a little piece of crap. <laughs> Confusion, which had started the moment she had stepped off the plane and not found anyone waiting for her, and which had then grown into an active panic on the airport's escalator, changing into a stunned block of perfect oddness the whole drive in, now as Olive stepped from the car onto the sidewalk, seemed to cause everything to sway around her, so that reaching to get her bag from the back seat, she actually stumbled and fell against the car. Easy, Mom, said Christopher. I'll get the bag. Just watch where you stop. Oh, goodness, she said, for already her foot had landed on a crusty roll of dog mess there on the sidewalk. Oh, hell, she said. I hate that, Christopher said. He took her arm. It's the guy who works on the subway and comes home early in the mornings. I've seen him out here while his dog takes his shit, looking around to see no one will catch him, just leaving it there. My goodness, said Olive. Because adding to her confusion was the additional factor of her son's loquaciousness. She had seldom heard him speak so passionately or so long, and she was quite certain she had never heard him use the word shit. She laughed, a false hard sound. The earlier clarity of the young pilot's faces came to her as something she had dreamed. Christopher unlocked a grated gate beneath the large brown stoop of stairs and stepped back to let her enter. So, this is your house, she said, and gave that laugh again because she could have wept at the darkness, the smell of old dog hair and soiled laundry, a sourness that seemed to come from the walls. The house she and Henry had built for Chris back home in Maine had been beautiful, filled with light, the windows large to show the lawns and lilies and fir trees. She stepped on a plastic toy and almost broke her neck. Where is everyone, she asked. Christopher, I've got to take off that shoe before I track dog mess all through the house. Just leave it here, he said, stepping past her. And so she slipped off the one suede sandal, and walking through a dark hallway, she thought how she had forgotten to bring another pair of pantyhose. They're out back in the garden, said her son, and she followed him through a capacious, dark living room into a small kitchen that was cluttered with toys, a high chair, pots spread over the counter, open boxes of cereal and minute rice. A grimy white sock lay on the table. And suddenly it seemed to Olive that every house she had gone into depressed her except for her own and the one they had built for Christopher. It was as though she had never outgrown that feeling she must have had as a child, that hypersensitivity to the foreign smell of someone else's home, the fear that coated the unfamiliar way a bathroom door closed, the creak in a staircase worn by footsteps, not one's own. She emerged, blinking, into a small outdoor area. This could not possibly be what he meant as a garden. She stood on a square of concrete. Around her was a chicken wire fence that had been knocked into by something large enough to leave a whole section gaping and broken. A child's plastic swimming pool was before her. In it, a naked baby sat, staring at her, while a small, dark-haired boy stood nearby, his wet swim trunk sticking to his skinny thighs. He stared at her as well. Behind him, a black dog lay on an old dog bed. Not far from Olive, a wooden staircase rose, leading to a wooden deck above her head. From the shadow beneath the stairs came the word, Olive. A woman appeared, holding a barbecue spatula. Gosh, there you are. What a sight for sore eyes. I am so glad to meet you, Olive. Briefly, Olive had the image of a huge walking girl doll. The hair was black and cut straight above the shoulders, the face as open and guileless as a simpleton's. You must be Anne, said Olive, but the words were lost in a hug the large girl wrapped her in, the spatula falling to the ground, causing the dog to groan and stand up. Olive could see this from just a sliver of vision left to her. Taller than Olive and with a stomach huge and hard, this Anne held her long arms around her and kissed the side of Olive's head. Olive did not kiss people. And so to be held in the arms of a woman taller than she was, well, Olive was positive this had never happened before. Do you mind if I call you mom? Asked the girl, stepping back but holding Olive by her elbows. I'm so dying to call you mom. Call me anything you want, Olive replied. I guess I'll call you Anne. <laughs> 
boy moved like a slithery animal to grab hold of his mother's ample thigh. You're Thaddeus, I suppose, said Olive. The boy began to cry. <laughs> Theodore, said Anne, honey, it's all right. People make mistakes. We've talked about that, right? A rash stood out high on Anne's cheek and ran down the side of her neck where it disappeared under a huge black t-shirt worn over black leggings. Her feet were bare. Bits of pink polish were on her toenails. Perhaps I'd better sit down, Olive said. Oh, absolutely, Anne said. Honey, pull that chair over here for your mother. In the midst of the aluminum beach chair, scraping across the cement, and the boy crying, and Anne saying, God, Theodore, what is it? In the midst of all this, one shoe off and one shoe on, sinking back into the beach chair, Olive distinctly heard the words, Praise Jesus. Theodore, honey, please, 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 please stop crying. In the plastic pool, the baby slapped the water and shrieked, Jesus, Annabelle, said Christopher, keep it down. Praise the Lord came distinctly from somewhere above. What in God's name, said Olive, putting her head back, squinting upward. We rent the top floor to a Christian, Anne said in a whisper, rolling her eyes. I mean, who would think here in this neighborhood we'd get stuck with a tenant who's a Christian? <laughs> Christian, said Olive, looking back at her daughter-in-law, thoroughly confused. Are you a Muslim, Anne? Is there a problem? <laughs> Muslim? The girl's plain, big face looked pleasantly at Olive while she bent to pick up the baby from the pool. I'm not a Muslim, quizzically. Wait, you're not a Muslim, are you? Christopher never... Oh, Godfrey, said Olive. <laughs> what she means, Christopher explained to his mother, fiddling with a large barbecue grill near the staircase, is that most people in this neighborhood don't go to church. We live in the cool part of Brooklyn. Hippity hop as hell, mother dear, where people are either too artsy-fartsy to believe in God or too busy making money. So it's somewhat unusual to have a tenant who's a real so-called Christian. You mean like a fundamentalist, said Olive, amazed once again at how talkative her son had begun. Had become. Right, said Anne, that's what he is, you know, fundamentally Christian. <laughs> the boy had stopped his crying and still holding his mother's leg said to Olive in a high earnest voice, whenever we swear, the parrot says, praise Jesus or God is king. And to Olive's horror and amazement, the child looked skyward and yelled, Shit! <laughs> Honey, said Ian, and smoothed his hair. Praise God, came the response from above. That's a parrot, asked Olive. Good Lord, it sounds like my Aunt Aura. Yeah, a parrot, said Ian. Weird, huh? You couldn't have said no pets allowed? Oh, we'd never do that. We love pets. Dog face is part of our family. Anne nodded in the direction of the black dog, who, having returned to his ratty bed, now had his long face resting on his paws, his eyes closed. Olive could barely eat her dinner. She had thought Christopher was going to grill hamburgers, but he had grilled tofu hot dogs. <laughs> and for the grown-ups had, of all things, diced up a can of oysters and poked them into these so-called hot dogs. Are you okay, Mom? It was Anne who asked. Fine, said Olive. When I travel, I sometimes find I'm not hungry. I think I'll just eat this hot dog roll. <laughs> sure, help yourself, Theodore. Isn't it nice to have Grandma come and stay? Olive put the roll back onto her plate. Not once had it occurred to her that she was grandma to Anne's children, who had been, she only recently discovered as the hot dogs had been set before her, fathered by two different men. Theodore did not respond to his mother's question, but gazed at Olive while he ate with his mouth open, making appalling chewing sounds. Less than ten minutes and the meal was over. Olive told Chris that she'd like to help clean up, but she didn't know where anything went. Nowhere, Chris said. Can't you tell? In this house, nothing goes anywhere. Mom, you go make yourself comfortable, Anne said. So Olive went down to the basement where they had brought her earlier with her little suitcase, and she lay down on the double bed. The fact was, the basement was the nicest place Olive had seen in the house. It was finished and painted all white, and even had, next to the washing machine, a white telephone. She wanted to cry. She wanted to wail like a child. She sat up and dialed the phone. Put him on, she said, and waited until she could only hear silence. Smack, Henry, she said. And she waited a while longer until she thought she heard a tiny grunt. Well, she's a big girl, said Olive, your new daughter-in-law, graceful as a truck driver. A little dumb, I think. 
something I can't put my finger on, but nice. You'd like her. You two would get along fine. Olive looked around the basement room she was in and thought she heard Henry grunt again. No, she's not going to hightail it up the coast anytime soon. Got her hands full here. Belly full, too. They've got me down in the basement. It's kind of nice, Henry. Painted white. She tried to think what else to say, what Henry would want to hear. Chris seems good, she said. She paused for a long time after that. Talkative, she added. Okay, Henry, she finally said and hung up. Back upstairs, no one was around. Thinking they must be putting the children to bed, Olive stepped through the kitchen and out onto the concrete yard where twilight was gathering. Caught me, said Anne, and Olive's heart banged. God, for you caught me. I didn't see you sitting there. Anne was holding a cigarette in one hand, balancing a beer on her high belly with the other, her legs apart as she sat on a stool by the barbecue. Have a seat, Anne said, gesturing toward the beach chair Olive had been sitting in earlier, unless it makes you crazy to see a pregnant woman drink and smoke, which I totally understand if it does, but it's just one cigarette and one beer a day. You know, when the kids finally get put down, I call it my meditation time. I see, Olive said. Well, meditate away. I can go back inside. Oh, no, I'd love your company. In the dusk, she saw the girl smile at her. Say what you might about judging a book by its cover. Olive always found faces revealing. Still, the nature of this girl was baffling. Was Anne a bit stupid? Olive had taught school enough years to know that large amounts of insecurity could take the form of stupidity. She lowered herself into her chair and looked away. She didn't want to guess what might be seen in her own face. It's nice to have them bonding. Olive opened her mouth to ask what kind of bond Theodore had with his real father, but she stopped. Maybe you weren't supposed to say real father these days. How old are you, Mom? Anne was scratching at her cheek. I'm 72, Olive said, and I wear a size 10 shoe. <laughs> Hey, cool, I wear a size 10. I've always had big feet. You look great for 72, Anne added. My mother's 63 and she, she what? Oh, Anne Shrek, you know, she doesn't look so good. Anne hoisted herself up, leaned toward the grill where she picked up a box of kitchen matches. If you don't mind, Mom, I'm just gonna have one more cigarette. Olive did mind. This was Christopher's baby in there, trying to develop its own respiratory system right about now. What kind of woman would jeopardize such a thing? But she said loudly, do what you want. I don't give a damn. Praise God, came from above them. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, said Olive. How can you stand that? Sometimes I can't, Anne said, sitting down again hugely. Well, Olive said, looking at her lap, smoothing her skirt. It's temporary, I guess. She felt the need to look away as the girl lit a fresh cigarette. Anne didn't respond. Olive heard her inhale, then exhale, as the smoke drifted back toward Olive. A realization flowered within her. The girl was panicking. How did Olive know this? Never in 72 years having put a cigarette to her lips. But the truth of it filled her. A light went on in the kitchen and Olive watched through the grated windows as Christopher walked to the kitchen sink. Sometimes, like now, Olive had a sense of just how desperately hard every person in the world was working to get what they needed. For most, it was a sense of safety in the sea of terror that life increasingly became. People thought love would do it, and maybe it did, but even if, thinking of the smoking Anne, it took three different kids with three different fathers, it was never enough, was it? And Christopher, why had he been so foolhardy as to take all this on and not even until after the fact bother to tell his mother? In the dear darkness, she saw Anne lean forward and put out her cigarette by sticking the tip into the baby pool, a tiny fst of a sound. Then the girl tossed the rest over toward the chicken wire fence. A horse. Christopher had not been truthful when he'd emailed that Anne had the pukes. Olive put her hand to her cheek, which had grown warm. Her son, being Christopher, would never be able to say, Mom, I miss you. He had said his wife had the pukes. Christopher stepped through the door, and her heart rose toward him. Come, join us, she said. Come, sit down. He stood, his hands loosely on his hips, and then he took one more, one hand and rubbed the back of his head slowly. Anne stood. Sit here, Chris. If they're asleep, I'm going to take a bath. 
He didn't sit on the stool, but pulled up a chair next to Olive and sat in the same sprawled out way that he used to sit on the couch at home. She wanted to say, it's awful good to see you, kid. But she didn't say anything, and he didn't either. For a long while, they sat together like that. She would have sat on a patch of cement anywhere to have this, her son, a bright buoy bobbing in the bay of her own quiet terror. So, you're a landlord, she finally said, because the oddity of that struck her now. Yep. Are they a nuisance, she asked. No, it's just the guy and his religious parrot. <laughs> What's the fellow's name? Sean O'Casey. Really? How old is he? She asked, pulling herself up in her chair so her breath could move through. Let's see, Christopher sighed, shifting his weight. He was familiar to her now, slow-moving, slow-talking. About my age, I think. A little younger. He's not related to Jim O'Casey, is he? The fellow that drove us to school? They had a shoe full of children. Remember his wife had to move once Jim went off the road that night? Remember that? She took the kids and went back to her mother. Is that guy upstairs one of those? Having a clue, Christopher said. He sounded like Henry, the absent-minded way Henry used to respond sometimes. Having a clue. It's a common enough name, Olive admitted. Still, you might ask him if he's any relation to Jim O'Casey. Christopher shook his head. Don't care to. He yawned, stretching out farther, his head thrown back. She had first seen him at a town meeting held in the high school gym. She and Henry were sitting there on folding chairs near the back, and this man stood near the bleachers close to the door. He was tall, his eyes set back under the brow, his lips thin, a certain kind of Irish face. The eyes not brooding exactly, but very serious, looking at her with seriousness. She had felt a pulse of recognition, although she knew she'd never seen him before. Throughout the evening, they had glanced at each other a number of times. On their way out, someone introduced them, and she found he had come to town from West Annet, where he taught at the academy. He had moved with his family because they needed more room, living out there now by the Robinsons' farm, six kids, Catholic. Such a tall man he was, Jim O'Casey, and during the introductions there seemed a whiff of shyness to him, a slight deferential ducking of his head, particularly as she shook Henry's hand, as though already apologizing for absconding with the affection of this man's wife, Henry, who didn't have a clue. As she stepped out of the school that night, into the wintry air, walking with a talking Henry to their car in the far parking lot, she had the sensation that she had been seen, and she had not even known she'd felt invisible. The next fall, Jim O'Casey gave up his job at the academy and started teaching at the same junior high school Olive taught at, the one Christopher went to, and every morning, because it was on the way, he drove them both there and then back home again. She was 44, he was 53. She had thought of herself as practically old, but of course she hadn't been. She was tall, and the weight that came with menopause had only begun its foreshadowing. So at 44, she had been a tall, full-figured woman, and without one sound of warning, she had, like a huge silent truck that suddenly came from behind as she strolled down a country road, Olive Kittredge had been swept off her feet. If I asked you to leave with me, would you do it? He spoke quietly as they ate their lunch in his office. Yes, she said. He watched her as he ate the apple he always had for lunch, nothing else. You would go home tonight and tell Henry? Yes, she said. It was like planning a murder. Perhaps it's a good thing I haven't asked you. Yes. They had never kissed, nor even touched only passed by each other closely as they went into his office, a tiny cubicle off the library. They avoided the teacher's room. But after he said that, that day, she lived with a kind of terror and a longing that felt at times unendurable. But people endure things. There were nights she didn't fall asleep until morning, when the sky lightened and the birds sang and her body lay on the bed loosened and she could not, for all the fear and dread that filled her, stop the foolish happiness. After such a night, a Saturday, she had been awake and restless and then fallen asleep with suddenness, a sleep so heavy that when the phone beside the bed rang, she didn't know where she was. And then hearing the phone picked up in Henry's soft voice, Ollie, the saddest thing happened. Jim O'Casey drove off the road last night right into a tree. He's in intensive care down in Hanover. They don't know if he'll make it. 
He died later that afternoon, and she supposed his wife was at his side, maybe some of the kids. She didn't believe it. I don't believe it, she kept saying to Henry. What happened? They say he lost control of the car. Henry shook his head. Terrible, he said. Oh, she was a crazy woman, privately. Absolutely nuts. She was so mad at Jim O'Casey. She was so mad she went into the woods and hit a tree hard enough to make her hand bleed. She cried down by the creek until she gagged, and she fixed supper for Henry. Taught school all day and came home and fixed supper for Henry. Or some nights he fixed it for her because she said she was tired and he'd open a can of spaghetti and God, that stuff made her sick. She lost weight, looked better than ever for a while, which lacerated her heart with irony. Henry reached for her often those nights. She was certain he'd had no idea. He would have said something because Henry was that way. He did not keep things to himself. But in Jim O'Casey, there had been a wariness, a quiet anger, and she had seen herself in him, had said to him once, we're both cut from the same piece of bad cloth. He had just watched her eating his apple. Oh, wait a minute, Christopher said, sitting up straight. Maybe I did ask him. Yeah, he said his father was the one who drove into a tree in, Cro tree in Crosby, Maine one night. What? Olive looked at her son through the darkness. That's when he got really religious. Are you serious? That's the parrot. Christopher extended an arm upward. Oh my goodness, said Olive. Christopher dropped his arm with an exaggerated gesture of defeat or disgust. Mom, I'm kidding you for crying out loud. I have no idea who the guy is. Through the kitchen window, Anne appeared, wearing a bathrobe and a towel around her head. Never liked that guy, Chris said musingly. Who, the tenant? Keep your voice down. No, what's his name? Mr. Jim O'Casey. So stupid to drive into a tree. That's as far as I'm going to read tonight. Thank you. So I would be um, happy to answer any questions that you have about um, anything. <laughs> Yes. What your inspiration for Henry was? My inspiration for Henry, um, he kind of uh, showed up after Olive, and I think um, there are parts of my father in Henry, just parts of my father, um, or parts of my fantasy of my father. I have, you know, we never know who, who these people really are, um, which probably makes people think, oh, Olive's her mother, and that's not true either, but um, he showed up uh, after Olive, and I think that it was a natural um, intuitive counterbalance to her. You know, she's so jagged in many ways, and it seemed believable to me. I know marriages where one is much, you know, more the easygoing um, person to someone else's uh, different kind of personality and yet it seems to work often and so uh, I just wanted him to be nice <laughs> so I made him <laughs> yes did you write one story at a time I wrote many stories at a time um yeah, I had I, I, I wrote on I, I worked on many many stories at one time and what what would happen is um, that one would eventually kind of reach a point it was interesting it was interesting to me where one would sort of all of a sudden become a little more um, full and would kind of demand it's and then I would finish it then I would work straight on that story until it was done but. Um, because it was pure concentration at that point on that one story, but uh, for, you know, and then I'd start again, I'd put that aside, and then I'd start again, you know, sort of making the rounds um, until one pushed forward again. Yes? Why did you decide to do it in separate stories instead of creating another? You know, I, I don't feel like I decided to be, to be truthful. It just came to, it just seemed um, right away when I wrote the first Olive story and I realized, oh, oh, wow, look, hi. <laughs> um, you know, she, 
I, I, I liked working with her, so to speak, and, um, and I knew that I would write a book about her, and it just, right away, um, I understood that it would be stories, and possibly because the first thing I wrote about her was a story, but also I think in hindsight, when I look back, and I was explaining to the class that I met with today, um, they were lovely, lovely class, um, that a lot of this gets done below the conscious level, and I, but looking back, I think that I sense that, you know, I think of Olive as episodic, and because form is subject, you know, story is, um, every story is the form it takes, that, that Olive required a form that was more episodic and, and not as linear or not as novelistic in a traditional sense. Um, that's what I think looking back, because <laughs> it sounds like I made a decision about it. <laughs> but I think must have <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yes? Do I feel that I finished with Crosby, Maine? Um, you know, I, I feel that way right now, but um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I like revisiting territory, um, the way in Criminal is revisited to my previous book, Abide With Me. I just, you know, and the thing I'm working on now, and I'm not going to tell any more about this than that, but I'm just, you know, it does take place in Shirley Falls, which is where Amy and Isabel took place. I can't help myself. It's just sort of, um, you know, I get a kick out of it, and I also just, that's what I like to do. So whether or not something will go back to Crosby, Maine eventually, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Yeah. Which story from the collection was the most difficult for you to write? The most difficult story for me to write in the collection was the hostage story where they're taken hostage in the bathroom, a different road. And I read a lot of, um, you know, I'm interested in the Stockholm Syndrome where um, in the 70s they, that, they were taken hostage in Stockholm and they fell in love with their hostage keeper. That was what was interesting to me. Um, about, you know, as I was writing about that. So I did a lot of reading about hostage situations, uh, mostly because I wanted to understand it physically as well as psychologically. And um, I also, um, my brother is a dentist and um, had just put in a new bathroom um, that was standard to the state law or something. And I said to him, John, can I, you know, just go and sit in there for a while? He's like, yeah. Sure, whatever, and I did. And I went and parked myself. I put my hands behind my back, and I sat there with the, you know, my head against the railing to see what it would be like to sit on the ground. You know, I didn't put a hospital robe on. I didn't go that far. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's big. That sense of exposure as well. Um, so I had to, I had to get it right. I had to get the whole thing right in many, many ways. But also, I didn't know. I mean, talk about form. I didn't know how to tell the story. I didn't know how to tell it until finally I understood that this would have been experienced as a trauma and that her memories could be, um, would be necessarily sort of um, splotchy. And when I realized that, that um, I think I describe it as paint, you know, paint splotches against her brain, sort of, that that's how I could describe it, that that's how, that's how I could tell it through her traumatized memory of it and then it was like finally but boy that was that was a real toughie as as we say in my family it's a joke <laughs> it's a toughie it's a toughie yeah yeah yes um i really love olive's unique language um for instance she says hell's bells a lot and um you said something else oh ducky in the <laughs> reading you just did um where did you get the ideas for that and what do you think it's I think it's regional. You know, I um, as as I was saying earlier today, you know, I have um, I spent the first twenty five years of my life in Maine. Um, and well, except for this law school thing that you know happened. <laughs> um, and then the last twenty six years I've been in New York, um, leaving out a few years because I'm 54 and I'm not good at math. Anyway, but that's essentially it. So it's regional. I, th I think it's regional. Um, there's a certain way of speaking that I grew up with that's very dry, and um, people kind of make up, you know, what whatever phrase sort of fits. Not, it doesn't have to remotely make sense. Um, but, of course, it makes sense to me. Um, 
into each other. You know, that's what's a little scary about these things. Um, so I think I think that's where you know it's the memory memory of. Not so much, but like I was saying, with my my many many elderly relatives that all lived on this dirt road, and you know I'd go visit them, and you know that was my recreation. We didn't have a TV or anything, and um, that would be my my childhood recreation, going to these grumpy people's houses and listening to them talk. So I think there's a, a you know resonance of that kind of of, of way of speaking. Yes. Yeah. When did the writing part of me come out? Because it looks like I was right. Um, it looks like like I was trying to be as we were saying a normal person for a while. But um, I, I, from a very young age, my mother encouraged me to write. She had wanted to be a writer, and she um, encouraged me to write. She loved to tell stories. She was a storyteller, very natural, and still is a brilliant storyteller. She's just so interesting to listen to. And um, and you learn by that. You learn like, oh, watch you know, watch her go here, but she comes back here and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, I had always wanted to be a writer. I always thought of myself as a writer. I always thought in terms like that. And then um, did do these other things because, you know, how does how does one face the world or, you know, as a young person say, I'm going to be a writer. I, I, you can do it. I mean, I, you know, if you're courageous, I wasn't, um, because people tend to to look at you with pity, or, or you know, sort of like you're you're leaking some sort of grandiosity. And I just, it's tiresome and depressing because it's hard enough to be getting you know rejections already and all that kind of stuff. So, I kind of kept it to myself. But I've always been, um, always just madly was writing things. And frankly. The truth is that in law school, um, you know, the textbooks are big, and um, they were big enough to hide paperbacks. <laughs> you know, read a lot of Nabokov during Constitutional. Um, I, you know, I did get a lot of reading done in, in law school. Yeah. So it's always been there. Yes. Um, aside from it being a region you're familiar with, why do you think all of this from Maine? Specifically, why did you separate me? I, I think because it was, you know, it's something I'm so. It, it's just, you know, I'll tell you, I'll give you a long answer to that. Um, well, not that long. Don't worry. Oh, it's awful when people say that's like, oh. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I wrote and wrote and wrote, and that goes back to the law. You know, I was writing and writing, and, and there was something that was not happening. I was certainly practicing the craft and understanding the craft more in my sentences, and I kept thinking, there's something I'm not getting. I, there's something that I'm just not really understanding. And so I took a stand-up comedy class because <sighs> the idea was, I thought to myself, well, we laugh at things that are true, and if I was immediately responsible for my audience, as opposed to writing, you can go sit, you know, you don't have to see anybody. That's the whole lovely thing about writing, is you can do it without being immediately viewed. And, and I thought, what would come out of my mouth in a stand-up comedy class? So I took one, and it was, it was the most frightening thing. It was so frightening. And every week, somebody would, else would drop out, because we were all frightened. But I stuck with it, um, just because I'm such a you know, Puritan at heart, <laughs> and I'd made this commitment to it. Anyway, the point is that I did end up, and then the, you know, those of us who survived, I think there were just a few of us, we did a night of stand-up comedy in New York City, and of course I wouldn't let anybody come that I knew at all, and um, it was just terrifying, but the whole point is that that's when I heard myself making jokes about being from New England, and being this you know, New Englander that went so far back. And I had I, I didn't know that about myself. I actually, I just didn't think anything. I just thought, I'm just me, and I moved to New York, you know. But it's huge. It's like this entire identity that's been trailing behind me for a long time with a particular outlook, um, no matter where I go. And so that did teach me that. Um, and, and so obviously, you know, it was worth it. Oh, goodness. 
Um, so that's why I think that Olive, kind of, in my mind, she represents a part of this country. I mean, this whole country's changing very quickly and has always been changing quickly, but there's this section up there in Maine that's, um, you know, they're very territorial and, um, and it's changing and, and people are coming, you know, up the coast. And so she represents, um, I think, a, a part of the very, in many ways, sort of the original, you know, Puritan background of this country that um, is getting diminished. Which is fine. That's how it. You know. That's what this country does. But so that's what I was capturing, trying to capture. Yeah. Oh, I'm from Maine, and so I kept reading, trying to sort of picture where in this. Where in Maine? Can I just say? Uh, I'm from Portland. Oh. Uh, so I'm not really from. I was. Just, never mind. We, <laughs> we know. I'm. So no, I kept reading, wondering. Like at first, I thought you were sort of in the Brunswick area, and then I was like, no, she's moving a little. More towards the coast. Did you have a location in mind? I didn't have a specific location. I mean, there are Brunswick um, landmarks there, just that yeah, kind of position me. But I sort of take towns that I've been in and, may, and meld them together. And Crosby is the name of my college roommate. And I called her up and I said, you know, hey, Cross, can I use your last name? And she's like, yeah. You know, she's a nice New England girl, and it just seemed like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, mid cut, you know. But it's it's all it's the melded together kind of. I think I was just sort of doing the below Augusta, above Augusta thing, and I assume probably below. Sort of, yeah, below. Probably sort of below. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting that connected the stories was like the fantasy of an affair. Like you get it with Henry and the niece, and you get it with um, Olive and Jim, and then like the intellectual affair with Armin and Daisy. But it kind of seems like it's blurred. It's not like the characters are making like a conscious choice like one way or the other. Like, what made you decide to keep it, like, like at least for me when I was reading, I got the sense that it was, like, a very hazy, like, in terms of, like, they weren't really committing either way. What made you, like, make that choice? Well, I thought, um, well, in terms of Henry and Olive, they... These were fantasies. These were, you know, this was a long lifetime marriage, and um, I personally, it, it's certainly up to every person. I personally didn't think that Olive would ever have gone off with Jim. I think that it was a, you know, sort of a, a thing that was happening during the course of her her long marriage. But she would never, I don't think, left, leave, um, have left. I do incorrect grammar when I'm like speaking public. <laughs> So, so that I saw in that term, you know, in terms of Harmon, that was more of, you know, kind of a, a, a real, a real possible rupture that was quite, quite um, terrifying for him. And um, I think that I kept it. What interested me is the. Um, what interested me wasn't the affair. You know, it's not it's not the affair that was interesting to me in either case, whether it's imagined or real. It's it's what is really what's behind what's really at work. You know, who's who's forgotten to be talking, who's or who's you know, how how or not, and I don't mean that to blame one person or the other, but like we think in terms of harm and, you know, here's an empty nest syndrome, but the man is the one, you know, here who's really, I mean, he's lonely. He misses his voice. And how do we deal with loss? What, what, what do we grab onto and how, you know, so that's what was interesting to me. And, um, and somebody recently said to me, boy, you're not a fan of marriage, are you? And I was, you know, and I, I, I said, well, actually, you know, I am, but that's okay. I mean, if they interpret it that way. So it's not, you know, it wasn't, I just, I'm always looking and interested in the complications of, of how hard it is, you know, to, to just live, <laughs> let alone, um, you know, marriages are, are, are complicated arrangements, um, and I think unknowable for, for many of the people involved in them, let alone anybody outside of them, so um, so it's, that's what's interesting to me, and so I left it hazy around the edges. Yes, and then, oh, you know what, let me just get her in the picture, yes. I'm just wondering how much of an impact your study of aging had on this book as compared to your personal inspiration or experience? Yeah. How much my the impact of getting that gerontology, which was actually interesting. I mean, that's how I managed to get back through law school. When I dropped out, I went back, and it was like, oh, okay, let me do something that makes it interesting to me, which was to think of 
a future in elder law, which I, you know, didn't end up having, but I was interested in gerontology. Um, you know, I don't know. It's hard to know. It's really hard to know. I did have all these elderly relatives. I mean, other people grow up riding bikes with kids. <laughs> or not me. You know, I grew up listening to these, these older people, and that... Um, I suspect that made me interested in the gerontology sort of thing. So I, you know, it's it's hard to know. I mean, it was many years ago that I got that but certificate, but I still remember things from those courses, um, even though they're probably way outdated at this point um, in terms of future research, new research or whatever. So I just I don't know is the answer. I don't know how much it influenced me or how much of the same package it is. So you've won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out, you know, because I don't, I don't believe things very quickly, um, and um, yeah, I just honestly, it's great. It's just, it's great. When I believe it, it's great, <laughs> and I, I'm believing it, you know, a little more often, and. Um, it is big, though. It's big. <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's a little, it's a little, um, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, you know, because I'm just me, and I'm still just me, and, um, yeah, I, I, a friend reminded me recently that I had written to him and said, so I won the Pulitzer Prize, and this seems to impress people. <laughs> yeah. It impresses me. I'm not pretending it doesn't. I just, you know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. Yes. Your descriptions of physical places are almost like a character. Yeah. How, how do you decide how much space to give? Yeah. Them? Um, it's a sense thing, you know. It's all, it's, uh, it's all. Um, this same friend who was joking to me about the Pulitzer, I was, he's a writer, and I was talking about. I said it always feels like my hand is in a cardboard box. And I'm and I have these shapes, and I'm moving. You know, I can't see what I'm doing, but I'm just moving these shapes around, and I just feel when they're better than not. It's not like right, but um, so it's like that. It's sort of you know, I try at a certain point to always feel like what it what it's like to be the reader. How much can the reader take of dialogue? How much can the reader take visually of you know a dense paragraph that they're, you know, there's, there's so many senses that are involved in that presentation and the narrative voice and all that sort of thing. So um, just how much physical world to put in is part of that decision. But I love the physical world. I mean, I just, you know, so I have to um, calm down. <laughs> Okay, that's enough sunlight, that's enough, you know. Um, but, you know, we live in a physical world. So, so, uh, yeah. But I, you know, and I do, I cut a lot. I revise obsessively and cut a great deal. And, um, and we'll cut physical world. <laughs> Yes. Um, our book club just read Olive Kittredge, um last month, and now we need to pick a new book. What is your favorite book? <laughs> Isn't that an awful question? A little bit. Could you tell me one? A little bit of an awful question. Um, <laughs> your top hundred, just one. Uh, well, um, whew. <laughs> you know, um, I just re I just read Let the Great World Spin. That was that was you know quite a read. I just reread Lady Chatterley's Lover. If you haven't read that, I would read that. Read that again. Or read it again. I mean, it was sort of like I read this book, huh? I didn't I didn't even remember this one. You know, it's it's so great. Um, I you know. I, there's so many books I love. Alice Munro, I like William Trevor. If you haven't read Love in Summer, he just wrote his latest one, Love in Summer, by William Trevor. I think it's out in paperback now. He's so wonderful. He's just yeah, anything by William Trevor. Yeah, I think you'll be just well served. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for um, all coming out and standing. I appreciate that. <laughs>